This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Deep South Dining is the show all about the culture of Southern flavor. From fried chicken and collard greens to shrimp and grits and a glass of sweet tea. Subscribe now to the podcast using any podcast app or download our MPB Public Media app. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Our guest for today is no stranger to the program, and he always brings a great perspective to one of our most popular topics, snakes. Terry Vendevender is passionate about Mississippi snakes, and he joins us today to answer your snake questions. Dr. Major's on the line, ready for pet questions, and we always like to hear about your current uh, encounters with nature. Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. And if you miss Creature Comforts on Thursdays, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So uh, I'd like to start the show on a bit of a personal note. Uh, I've mentioned my cat, Bo, on the air a number of times. And since uh, we discovered him, I left out in the bushes here at MPB, and I adopted him. Dr. Major was his vet, helping me take good care of him. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, uh, this past weekend, uh, we discovered that he was suffering from acute kidney failure, and I had to put him to sleep on Tuesday. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Major for what he did to help him while he was alive to take good care of him and the compassion that he showed uh, when we had to make the difficult decision to put him to sleep. So I say Rest in peace to my little guy. And again, Dr. Major, thank you for for all you did uh, for me and for for Bo. Listen, that was a very uh, sad situation. It was an acute kidney failure. There had been some uh, probably congenital things that just started to show up at his age. Uh, He was about seven, is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Give or take. But uh, there was, uh, it was, it was, a merciful thing, actually, to put him to sleep simply because he was in pain and uh, very, very uh, sick. And I appreciate you. And I'll say this to folks listening. Um, you know, you when we go through this, this is our, our pets, that part of our family, and it's a very difficult situation. But, you know, think about your veterinarian because, you know, Dr. Major, he's he's got all of his patients are part of his family. And so for the vet as well, it's a difficult situation to go to. And, and so, again, I appreciate the way that Dr. Major handled it and uh, and know that we did the right thing because he was, you know, that's the other thing. I've had two cats that have gotten sick like that, and to, and to see a cat just kind of moping around, having no energy, not running around or doing anything, it's it's not the way cats are supposed to be. So I think it is the was the better thing to do. And uh, it was tough, but, you know, we'll get over it, and eventually I think I'll probably get another cat. But uh, for now, I'm going to just uh, keep him in, in my memory, and, and we'll go from there. So I appreciate uh, folks letting me have that little bit of a personal moment first. Um, so let's, uh, let's get on to, to happier things. Uh, Libby, what's been going on in your yard? What have you been seeing? Oh, gosh, lots of birds, but uh, the main event still are the fireflies. There's several species of fireflies out, and um, the one I enjoy the most on our property is um, the synchronous firefly. The frontalis have been showing off for the last couple of weeks, so that's been a lot of fun. And I'm just urging people to get outside a little bit uh, and see whatever fireflies they have available to them. And I think most people will be able to see at least some. Uh, There's some treetop flashers going on, a couple of um, species that are pretty easy to see um, all around the Jackson area. If you just look up into the tops of the trees, you can find those. There are... um, easy to, well, I I guess relatively easy to learn techniques for um, identifying the different flashes for different species. If people want to do that, you can get a book to do it, or you can just enjoy the flashing. And uh, the synchronous fireflies are um, along the Natchez Trace in several places. And uh, I would appreciate viewers calling and letting us know what kind of fireflies they're seeing in their part of the state. And um, I, I want to make it clear that they, they in no way migrate. They, uh, 
fireflies of pretty much every species um, either lay their eggs on the in the ground, right on the the leaf litter, the top of the ground, and they um, emerge from those eggs as little larvae, and they'll stay there for pretty much a year, and then they'll pupate for a little while, much like a butterfly does, and then um, emerge as an adult with wings. And the purpose for the flying and the flashing is to find that mate so they can lay the eggs again and start over the next year. But what you get is an effect of they, they, they emerge as the temperatures warm up. So it, you go from the southern parts of the state to the northern parts, of course. And uh, so ours are starting to wane a little bit, so I know they're going to be emerging around Grenada. And um, the first weekend in June will be at Wild Oxy State Park if all goes well, and those emerge on time. So we should have a good show up there. And that's a, anybody uh, that lives in the northern part of the state that is interested in seeing the synchronous fireflies, I think that would be a good time to see them. That'll be, I guess, June the 2nd, 3rd, 4th is when we'll be there to talk about the fireflies and look at them with visitors. But um, you'll be able to see them probably at least for two weeks after that date or uh, at least a few, and they'll be all around in the woods around that part of the state. So it's just a fun thing to do. Uh, we've all been looking for rare um, fireflies called the cypress firefly, and they do prefer cypress trees, and they prefer to get out on a kind of a edge of a branch that's hanging over the water. And they do a, a little complicated kind of blink of four to say four to nine quick blinks together and while they're seated on the leaf and then they will drop down and glow as they're making a little j or u shape and then go back to that leaf and do their blinks and repeat Mm. it so they get that little drop down which is really cool and if conditions are just to their liking uh what they're what they're aiming for is to get a double blink so that they are reflected from the water which is also a really cool (laughs) thing for you so if you can position yourself so anyway if you really want to get into fireflies you might start looking for the cypress firefly and uh about 8.45 is when we found that they really started blinking. So it's, um, it's you know, pretty much really dark then. So if you needed another reason to be interested in fireflies, as you mentioned, this is kind of, this is the, their life. I mean, this is what they're kind of there for. So this is the culmination of, of what they've been put on earth for. So it adds a little bit of extra, maybe importance to it to know that this is their, kind of their swan song. So that's yeah, kind of cool. I don't, I don't know how a firefly, you know, yeah, I think of it, oh, this must be the the epitome of life for them but i don't know maybe their happiest times are a a grub in the leaves hunting i think i've heard they're pretty good hunters that anything smaller than themselves are prey little bitty snails and little bitty slugs and small worms and that kind of thing they look kind of armored If, if you're really into it you can look them up but uh it's a a little beetle that has some armor on his back and um they're they're cool looking all right this is creature comforts on mpb think radio we've got an early caller on the line and it looks like a question coming up for dr major so we say good morning to melanie who has called in from memphis today good morning you're on the air so go ahead hey um i have a question about my friend has a pet turtle i think it's a red-eared pond flyer um and she's going off to college it's been an aquarium all its life she was. Th- she can't take it with her to the dorm, and she was thinking of letting it go in the local pond. But like it's been fed pallets all its life and lived in an aquarium all its life, so I just wanted to know if like that would be okay for it, if it or like if it probably die. Um, there are some dangers both to that turtle and to turtles that are in whatever pond it got released in, and uh, Terry's. Herpetologist is interested in everything, so we'll we can get everybody's opinion. But my suggestion would be to take it to the Natural Science Museum in Jackson or a facility like that. If 
they don't live in this area, to um, just be sure you want you don't want to release an, an animal that might not be completely healthy and that their you know their chances that it could carry something to that pond. So just to be have an abundance of caution, it would be better to take it somewhere like that if you can't find a good home yeah, for a it. nature center, someplace like that. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Major, do you see many reptiles uh, in the <clears throat> in the clinic? See quite a few from time to time. On the flip side of that, uh, Libby, uh, this particular, uh, I guess, red-eared slider uh, may not be as uh, resistant to diseases that it might be exposed to mm-hmm. yeah. from the other other uh, turtles since it's been in a protected situation. Yeah, it's it's uh, so it's kind of a dangerous situation for that turtle too. Yeah, a lot of the okay. turtles that we we see at the at the clinic have been injured for one reason or another, and we try to do the best we can with those. And there are some turtle rehabbers in in the area as well. All right, so Melanie, yeah, we think maybe if there's uh, something in the Memphis area similar to the Natural Science Museum here in Jackson that uh, Libby suggests oh. that you might uh, go try to find a place. Yeah, Lichterman Nature Center. I forgot that yeah. she was in the Memphis area. That's a great place. Oh, that, yeah. All righty, thanks. Okay, well. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, like, my friend was saying I could keep it, but I didn't want to ruin the turtle's life if it would be happier in the pond, you know, so I thought I would call. Oh, you might want to keep it then. Yeah, once it's been yeah. in captivity for very long, it's probably <laughs> safer for that turtle and everybody concerned for you to keep it. And if it's proven itself to be happy in captivity, yeah. then... Um, and if you've given yeah. it a name, hey. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, so All right. Yeah. We pulled a snake out, and we're in a minute we'll talk to Terry, and he'll tell us what he's gotten with him. But right now, Libby's uh, got him. And it's um, not too big of it, but what's about maybe 30 inches, maybe 30 inches long. So, yeah. So we'll dive into that in just a minute. But we do have another caller on the line. So why don't we say good morning to Rebecca, who called in from Fulton today. Rebecca, you're on the air. Go ahead. Good morning. How are y'all? Good. Good. No, I look, um, I'm at the King Tom Waterway. I was going to go walk. And I, I often see water birds there, of course. And this morning, I saw two two birds, two large white birds with yellow. I mean, with yellow orangish beaks, and they look like a stork. <clears throat> and when I looked for just a white stork, it's in Africa. So, but I looked, and the only thing that they that there's listing for Mississippi is like a wood stork. Yes. But, but um. But this one doesn't look like that. It's white all over. And I was just wondering, is it maybe it's a juvenile? Um, all right. Can you describe the beak area? Did you, does it, you looked online though, right? So you kind of got some ideas. Did the beak really, the stork has an unusual beak. Like, it, it does. It does have an unusual beak. Okay. And so this bird does too. Um, send me a picture of it and I'll identify it for you. Well, or the is that hard is, to do? Uh-huh. It, it's hard to do. I, I, I can't get close enough to them to without them flying away. Um, I've I've tried taking pictures of water birds before, without you know, and and they this t- you know those water birds tend to fly off. Yeah, before I can get close enough to yeah. take take the picture. If you look at um, egrets and herons in your bird book or online, uh, they're really three different species that could be. They've got a little yellow feathering on their head and uh, kind of look at that and look at the, the color of the beak, the color of the legs, if you can see that. And um, the, the that'll legs help you were identify. Orange. The, or- the, the legs, were- legs are orange. Okay, and is the beak orange as well? Yes. But everything else is white. So, but, you don't I mean, think- seen- but you don't think it's a heron? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm. Uh-huh. I'm no, that's fine. Really yeah, that's yeah. No, that's why you called because you couldn't figure it out, right? So I, what right. I would say is, yeah, look at the um, egrets again. Go back and look at. There's a great egret that's you know large, and then there's a, a smaller snowy, and um, the reddish egret has a stage where it's kind of white, and um, a cattle egret is 
pretty common, and he's got that bright, he's got bright orange legs and a beak, bright orange beak, and then he's got little patches of kind of brownish yellow on his head and breast and around, and uh, that would be a, a possible choice. Yeah. That, w- that would probably that, uh, be the most common, yeah. Okay. The, the reason why I was surprised to see this is because it is just all white except for the beak and the legs. And so, anyway, but I, I'll look, and thank you so much. Yes, good luck with it. And, and if you get a picture, send it to me. Yeah, Rebecca, even if you get a, a picture from far away, you know, with a lot of editing programs, you can zoom in on a picture that's already been taken. So if you can get one, you know, mm-hmm. uh, send it in. And what you would need to do would be to just email it to animals at mpbonline.org. We'll send it over to Libby, and we'll see if we can help you. If we can, find. If not, mm-hmm. you know, no, no harm, no foul, as they say. Yeah, and um, oh, okay. Yeah, kind of look around between the eye and the beak. There's some, you know, small amounts of color there. Like if there's some red there, you know, it's going to be a um, a snowy egret. Well, actually, while we're talking, the bird uh-huh. flew away. So. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's all right. It, they tend to come back, so okay. You may right. see okay. it again. Well, I'll, 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 I'll try to take a picture. Thank you okay. so much right. for your help. Good sure luck. thing. Thanks, right. Rebecca, Bye-bye. for your phone call. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Our guest this morning is Terry Vandeventer. He is our expert uh, on snakes. So, Terry, before we dig into things about snakes in Mississippi, as I mentioned, we had one. You brought one in, and we had him out here for just a little bit. Tell us uh, what kind of snake it was, and if you would describe it for folks listening. Well, sure. It's, we always like to bring a snake into the studio, even though it's radio. <laughs> but we got a couple of pictures of Libby with it. I brought in a hognose snake today, an eastern hognose snake. And it gets its name because its snout turns up on the end like a pig. Uh, but your grandma doesn't call it that. She calls it a spread natter or a puff adder. And the reason reasoning behind that is it's uh, elaborate defensive processes where when you approach one, they spread their neck like a cobra. They blow and make noise and look terrible. And interestingly enough, if that doesn't scare you away, they flip over and play possum. Uh-huh. And they they go belly up and they, they play dead. And uh, some people call them drama queens. And, you know, <laughs> we biologists, we kind of shy away from that. <laughs> but but nonetheless, it's a, it's a fascinating snake. And we don't see as many as we used to in the old days. One of 56 different kinds of snakes in Mississippi. And I noticed uh, th- th- when he first came out, and there's something that you've told us about before, that tongue came out immediately and it started kind of right. sampling his atmosphere, I guess. Right. The forked tongue uh, going a mile a minute, picking up uh, chemical clues from all around it. Uh, a snake's existence is based on chemistry. So it smells everything around it. And the prongs of the tongue, uh, the forked tongue, uh, actually allows the snake to smell in stereo. Hmm. So he can smell to the left, smell to the right, uh, put it all together, and it helps him to analyze his situation. He didn't yeah. know me at all, so he yeah. yeah his, but he, immediately he, he had to start checking that but out. But he behaved yeah. himself very nicely. Yeah, <laughs> very nicely. And that's I I thought about I could scare him or slap beside him or something and maybe get him to spread. But I, if we took I, him I decided out the grass, against that. If we yeah. took him out in the grass, he would immediately revert and begin looking like a like a cobra, I guess. So. And I think you mentioned they come in a variety of colors. Yes. Uh, uh, for 45 years, I told school children that hognose snakes come in 32 flavors, just like ice cream. <laughs> you, get, you get black ones, which today was a black one. We get orange ones with black spots, yellow ones with spots. Um, they, they, they come in just some are banded. Some, they, they come in all different varieties. And we're not exactly sure why. All babies basically look the same, and they change when they get older. Hmm. We've got a caller on the line, so we'll say good morning to our friend Kathleen, who calls from Osaka. Good morning, Kathleen. You're on the air with us. Good morning, guys. We've got to finish a chapter here on the big snake that entered my house uh, for the winter. Remember, it was outside. I was stepping out my back door, and I saw this line going up the side of the house. Well, I I thought it was a termite line or something. I didn't have my glasses on. So I get my glasses <laughs> And the tail of the snake is about a foot and a half, two feet off the bottom of the ground. And the rest of the snake is straight up all the way to the roof line. And another part of it was already in the 
the part that goes by the uh, roof line. So it had to be at least 10 feet. It had, it had to be 10 feet. So I got close and looked at it, and I waited for the rest of it to go, and it, it went up into the attic somewhere. And uh, I need to know, I'm thinking it's a female, okay? How long does it take them to have them stay? Should be gone by now, because I never did see her leave. And every time the cat knocks a book off the shelf, I'm going, snake! <laughs> <laughs> well... I hear I hear a pop in the middle of the night. I'm straight awake, you know. <laughs> well, I have I, I have absolutely no doubt what kind of snake that is. Uh, it's uh, it's your grandma's chicken snake. Uh, that's what uh, most people in Mississippi call a chicken snake. It's a rat snake. They are tremendous climbers. They can go up a brick wall like going across the ground. Hmm. They go up into attics commonly to get rats and mice that are chewing on your wiring. And, and causing problems up there. They're one of our bigger snakes in Mississippi. They, uh, they're, again, they're, they're rat specialists, but they get their name because they sometimes enter hen houses and swallow eggs or, or biddies. But uh, there's no other snake in Mississippi that would be behaving the way that one is. And so he's up there doing you a favor. And as the warm weather comes, you know how hot an attic gets. And he won't be able to survive up there. So he'll move along and he'll go elsewhere and do someone else a favor. And then next spring, he'll come back and finish up the rats again. <laughs> so, but nothing, nothing to worry about. Somebody actually asked me, do, do you know the snake? I said, I've never been introduced, but he can stay up there as long as he doesn't come at my house. <laughs> yeah, he knows you probably very well. Yeah. Knows your habits. Well, yeah. the thing is, it was, it was gray, like a gray olive, and it had an odd little shaped scale. It was more like a teeny, teeny barefoot kind of thing, and it had a kind of margarine yellow belly with kind of an orangey uh, hue at the edge of that. And I mean... When I all I had to do when I put my glasses on, my mouth just dropped. I couldn't even scream. I'm about to go. What am I going to do way out here? <laughs> yeah. Well, Thanks. nothing. Nothing to worry about. You did the right thing. Sounds like. <laughs> all right, uh, Kathleen. Okay. Well, I'll wait for him to pack his bag. Oh, by the way, do you think it was a he or she that would be doing this? Uh, 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 males are larger. Males are are the larger of the sex, and uh, uh, so probably you know unless unless. He told you differently. <laughs> you know, it, it would have been a male snake. No, I didn't spike my cotton, my coffee, or my tea. <laughs> so I'm looking at it, scared me half to death. But I'll wait here to pack up and leave home. All right. All right y'all have a good day. Thanks, Kathleen, for your phone call. <clears throat> so, uh, Terry, what type of snakes might we find in our backyards this time of year? Um, little snakes that I grew up calling D.K. snakes, named after James D.K., a naturalist from New York back in the, back in the 1800s. But um, the little D.K. snakes, one of the most common snakes found in Mississippi are, in, in backyards, are earth snakes. And they're a foot long, maybe, unicolored gray or tan, brown, nondescript. And you find them in the monkey grass, you find them in your water meters, you find them under landscape timbers, especially in the springtime. People say, oh, they're baby water moccasins or they're ground rattlers. They're not. They're perfectly harmless little worm eaters, and, uh, but they're, they're very common. Speckled king snakes come through, black with little white speckles all over them, like they've been dusted with salt. Um, and occasionally the rat snake or chicken snake will come through as well. So we, you know, j just depending again on the habitat that you provide them and, and, and what parts of Mississippi you live in, probably if you're in a, a dense location and, of apartments and condominiums and wall to wall, you know, houses in a, in a neighborhood, you're not going to see as, as many snakes for sure. As promised, we've got some calls on the line, so let's begin by uh, going to Hancock County. Joe is on the line. Good morning, Joe. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Good morning. Uh, Terry, this is Joe down here in the kill. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for coming out to our libraries um, recently and uh, doing what you do probably most of your life, is visiting people in the and informing them. So I want well, to thank you for that. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I've been to the Kill Library many, many times, and my programs of over 45 years, 
ended last July when I finally retired. <laughs> <laughs> but always had a good time. Always had a good time at Kill. Yeah, you and I spoke for about a half an hour before you uh, started your presentation. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Um, I'm a forester for over 40 years down here, and uh, I know my snakes. I've known them for over 50 years, and people call me the snake lover. And <laughs> if they got a snake in the house or in the yard, they'll call me, and I'll come pick it up and move it trans and locate it somewhere where else. Yeah, good. Um, I get bitten once or twice a year, mainly by yellow or rat snakes um, that are hunting uh Bird eggs this time of year. Mm -hmm. I can't believe how good a sight they have. But um, I've only bitten been bitten a couple times by poisonous snakes as a forester, but only because I was looking up at the trees and not down on the ground, and they bit my boot. So I, I've never been bit, bitten. Uh, the first story is uh, one time in the woods I found a cargo snake, and I, of course I knew what it was, and I was, I feel guilty about telling this story, but uh, I said, well, I'm going to make it play dead. So I made it play dead, and it did so. And out popped, out of his mouth came about an inch and a half toad and hopped away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's actually uh, uh, a pretty common thing, as a matter of fact. Uh, my neighbor found a hognose snake uh, two weeks ago, and while we were looking at it, um, it went through its little routine is defensive routine and out came a toad and uh, i've seen this many many times uh uh hognose snakes eat uh they eat almost exclusively toads they they a lot of times you won't right. even touch a frog but they uh i think they eat almost daily uh most snakes eat you know every week or so something like that but i think hognose snakes feed more frequently and i can't tell you how many times i've seen that that very scenario of finding one and uh, and and this makes him less palatable to an enemy. Perhaps toads are toxic. Sure. And um, and also, if he's got a big toad in his belly, he can't crawl away very quickly. So I'm sure he so found I'm another. Funny. I'm sure he found another toad. You know, shortly thereafter. <laughs> well, the toad. The toad was my best friend. Uh, I was his best friend. The, the, the <laughs> it, it, it hopped away, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I've seen him hop away. They so meaning he had only swallowed it moments before. But uh, that's that's interesting. Right. Yep, yep. So all right. Okay. The, well, that's all. That's all I well, have. Good, Thank you very much. I good hearing from you. Good story. Thanks, yeah. Joe. Yeah, that great snake story there. Let's uh, stay on the phone lines. Next, Will has called us, uh, and he is from Carthage. You're on the air, Will. Go ahead. Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, my question is, is, are there any other kind of baits that you can use in a snake trap other than fresh chicken eggs? Well, um, I, th I think that's probably, it, it depends on what you're trying to catch. If you're trying to catch, you know, chicken snakes, rat snakes around your um, hen house, yeah, eggs would be the thing to use. Um, most snake traps are long traps made of wire and they have a funnel at both ends like a fish trap and they put the egg, eggs in there and the snake crawls in and then he can't figure out how to get back through those funnels but um i suppose you could put some baby chicks in there uh, that would you know they can't get out either and that would certainly lure uh, a snake if you're having a problem with a with a chicken snake around your hen house, uh, that sounds like probably the, the best thing to do. Then you can take him a, you know, a half mile down the road and, and let him go, and hopefully he won't come back. Well, well see, that's just the thing. I don't have uh, access to the uh, fresh eggs. Uh, and I have a minnow trap. And okay. I actually caught a snake in there one time. I wasn't right. even trying to catch it. I just left it out on the ground, and for some reason it went in there. Yeah. But I, I was just wondering, is there anything that they've been attracted to other than fresh eggs? Well, again, it depends on what you're trying to get. Do you have what you consider a problem snake? A particular snake you're I, having a problem I, with? Or or you just don't uh, want snakes around? Well, see, it's in my storage area. And uh, me and my wife went in there uh day before yesterday, and we saw a skin where it's unshaded. Okay. Now, he may have he, come he and gone. Yeah, he may have he may have come, shed his skin, and then went about his way. And also, that skin could have been in there for a very long time too, and before you ever found it. So, snakes have territories; they have regions that they they follow, you know, and and they they know their way around very well. 
and they they frequent certain areas that have food supplies and shelter, and then they leave and they go someplace else. But they're they're very faithful to these these areas. So, you know, he might still be in the area, but he may very well have moved on, and he'll come back another time, maybe. So you well, might. Well, if, I hope he, I hope he left. Well, <laughs> well, uh, and maybe he did. Maybe he did for sure. Okay. Okay. All right, then. Uh, appreciate it. Well, thanks for calling in. All right, Will. Thanks for your call. Right, this thanks. is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, talking about snakes with our guest for the hour, Terry Van Deventer. Uh, so, Terry, you've, you've touched upon a, a, a couple of them, but what are some of the benefits of having snakes in your yard? Well, snakes are intrinsically good things. They're they're good things. They're not bad. They're not evil. They're they're good things, and uh, they're beautiful. They're elegant in form. They often have the colors of jungle birds and tropical fish, which are animals that we admire, you know. But snakes get a bad rap. Uh, snakes feed on rats, different kinds of rodents. They, they feed on uh, injurious insects. You know, they eat all kinds of things. Most snakes feed on invertebrates and smaller vertebrates, not necessarily rats and mice. But, but in some way, they help us. They help us, you know. Um, how does... That cardinal that you like seeing at your feeder, how does he help you? Well, you know, we like him. He's beautiful. He's fun to have around. And uh, I personally, my wife, Ginger, and I, we make our property snake friendly. We put areas out there where snakes can find homes. Um, and, you know, if, if our favorite speckled king snake is crossing the yard and a red-tailed hawk comes down and gets him, oh, that might seem a little sad, but... I would not intervene, you know, and by the same token, when the rat snake goes in the bluebird box, I don't intervene there either. But, um, you know, we have a, a five-year-old grandson who loves to go to the woods with Papa Daddy, <laughs> and our property is chock full of venomous snakes, and, uh, and we have no worries whatsoever. We, he walks with me, and we look. And uh, and he he loves it. And I don't give a wit if he ever becomes a herpetologist or even a biologist, <laughs> just as long as he understands there's other things out there. So. So you mentioned a snake friendly. If someone does want to make their yard snake friendly, what are some of the things they could do? Uh, get rid of that green desert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> get rid of the mower, get rid of the green desert and uh, plant natives. You know, plant native, gosh, we have all kinds of native plants on our property, beautiful. And, um, you know, wood piles, if, if you don't want snakes, get rid of those wood piles. Get rid of those old outhouses out there that are, that are housing junk that your husband says he's going to someday use because he's not. <laughs> you know? Get rid of those things and keep your grass mowed. And, but if you want snakes, just do the opposite. You know, you know keep keep log piles wood piles around they're, they're good for other kinds of wildlife too you know got some callers on the line let's start again in greenwood joyce has called in today good morning joyce go ahead good morning i will make this real fast <laughs> um i'm scared of snakes i was raised on a farm and i'm a senior citizen but anyway i was programmed very young but i've recently moved to greenwood and i live across from the Yazoo River, and I've seen, in a year, I've seen three snakes with like a coral streak on their back, and someone said, in my backyard, and someone said, those are innocent snakes, you know, but then I was told you can put lime around your house and snake away and mothballs. Uh, do you agree with that, that that will tell them to go on down the street <laughs> well <laughs> well <clears throat> those are fighting words uh with some people for sure no there's absolutely nothing in the world that it that serves as a snake repellent you can go buy products and they say they'll keep them away no they won't and there's no such thing if there was such a thing as a snake repellent uh countries such as burma and costa rica and india who have you know, lots of venomous snakes and lots of bites, and it's really part of the, the, the big medical scene. They would use it, but there's no such thing, and you're just wasting your money. Let me mention mothballs. Uh, your neighbor's going to tell you that they, they lived on their property for 30 years. They never saw a snake. Then they saw a snake. They put out mothballs, and they never saw another one. 
Well, mothballs are something that all through the Deep South, people have touted for snake repellent, and it does not work. And technically, it's illegal to, uh, to use the substance in a manner that's not prescribed by the federal government. And it's a waste of time. Also, one very important factor is that mothballs are instrumental in poisonings in children and pets throughout Mississippi. And people say they won't eat a mothball. Yes, they will. It's bright and shiny and sparkly and looks like candy. And children eat them all the time. So so um, the, th- the thing to do if you don't want snakes around your property, mow your grass, keep keep your, you know, keep trash piles up, wood piles, piles of tin roofing. Keep your property looking nice. And the snakes won't hang around. They'll pass on through and they'll go over to your neighbor's ratty place. So, so uh, try not to worry about them. And when you see one, take two steps back, take a picture with your phone, and send it in, and we'll tell you what it is. How's that? Well, thank you so much, and I'm so glad you shared that because I'm an animal lover, and I would never do anything, you know, to harm an animal. Well, thank and you. And I thank you so much, and have a good day. You too. Thank you for Bye-bye. calling in. Thanks for your call, Joyce. <clears throat> this is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Let's stay on the phone lines because next we've got Jerry, who's calling us from Bay Springs. Jerry, you're on the air with us, so go ahead, please. Yes, sir. How you doing this morning? Good. What do you have for us? Uh, I, I missed the name of that little snake that uh, that uh, the snake expert was talking about. He said maybe it got up to a foot long and it was brown or tan. What was the name of that? Right. Well, there's there's several little nondescript brown snakes that are about a foot long that live, you know, in your yard and monkey grass and along, you know, places like that. And there's several. There's there's most of them are called earth snakes, which is very descriptive. They just live down close to the ground. And then there's another one that um, we call a a brown snake, but I grew up calling it a DK snake named after a man by the name of DK. And these little tiny brown snakes are full grown. They eat slugs and worms and they're completely harmless. Does, does that help out? Yeah. I've seen, I've seen those several times on my property. Yeah. Just wondered what they were. Yeah. Like a lot of people, I thought it was a baby, uh, something or another. Like right. A water mark yeah. Something. Some of our snakes uh, on my property is a snake called a little, uh, it's called a crown snake because it has a little marking on its head that looks kind of like a crown, I guess. And it's mis- it's the smallest snake in America, and an adult is like yeah. eight inches long. Wow! So, <laughs> oh, okay. yep. I didn't know they were limited like that. Yeah, um, and then then we have well, big ones too. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a, I got another question. The, the country boys down here that I used to work with said that. Uh, you only find rattlesnakes really in certain places. There's other places where they won't go at all. And uh, we were working down at Camp Shelby, and, man, we, uh, of course, back then, you know, you didn't want a rattlesnake around you anywhere. We ran over one that stretched from one side of the road to the other side of the road with uh, trucks. We were hauling concrete slabs with the truck, so we pretty much killed it. But it, it was probably 8 or 10 foot long at Camp Shelby. And I just wondered if that country tale was true that they only hang out in certain areas and they wouldn't go to other areas well it's it's not that they they necessarily won't go to those other areas but but they have preferred habitats and uh they you know diamondbacks yeah. like high sandy longleaf pine forest and uh, they are our biggest snake in mississippi uh not necessarily the longest but they are the biggest because of their weight so uh yeah. and in the day diamondbacks were were important snakes but we don't see nearly as many as we used to we saw a lot of rattlesnakes down at camp Shelby. yeah and that's because that area is managed as a longleaf pine forest it's burned it's uh, it's kept in longleaf pine and and of course they protect the gopher tortoise and that's an instrumental animal in the, in the life of the eastern diamondback yeah, that's what we were actually carrying with some concrete slabs to go across creeks so that the gopher turtles wouldn't be killed by the Humvees and yep. and uh, the light tanks and everything that they yep. practiced with. That's and, great. That's great. So, All right, uh, Jerry, thanks for your call this morning. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Another caller on the line. This time we'll go to Ed, who's called us from the road. Good morning, Ed. What do you have for us? Good morning. Um uh, 
my story is more related to Virginia, where I'm from. Just happened to be traveling through Alabama and uh, going through Mississippi. But uh, just last week, I was uh, going through our compost pile, get ready for uh, gardening season, planting season, and I came across some hatched out snake eggs. I believe they were uh, black snakes, snake eggs, but. Uh, I don't know. They could have been maybe a copperhead, too. We have those in the area. And then just another comment. Uh, again, it's for Virginia, but uh, when I was trout fishing, too, uh, last week, uh, noticed the brown. I guess it's some type of water snake yep. coming down, downstream. So just just neat sightings of snakes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, I'll point out uh, that copperheads are live bearers. They don't lay eggs, so don't worry about him. But, um, okay. <laughs> but m- many Good. snakes bury their eggs in, in compost. It, it's a nice, warm place. And if you think it was a black snake, a black racer, uh, if you can look at them, uh, a black racer's eggshell will look like sandpaper. It'll look like you salted it. It actually has grains of, uh, of what looks like salt. And so uh, it looks like coarse sandpaper. And, uh, and, of course, if you're trout fishing, you're finding northern water snakes, which are... In some small way, your competition. <laughs> so, yeah, but, and, yeah, but, per, but perfectly harmless. So, yeah. yep. Well, that's good. And that's uh, great info on the. Uh, glad to hear about the copperheads. Yeah. Oh, the yeah, they, they're, they're live sure. bearers. So, nothing to worry about there. So, all right, Ed. Uh, okay. Thanks. And I have seen the black. Yeah, sure, sure. Have a great day. All you right. too. Thank thanks, you. Ed. Thanks for calling in. <clears throat> I've got a couple minutes left. So, uh, Terry, you mentioned that uh, if you see a snake, if you come across a snake out and about, to maybe take a couple of steps back. And, you know, we've talked about how humans are afraid of snakes. Snakes aren't real happy with humans either. They're, and you can imagine if you're a, a human, <coughs> if you look at it from the snake's perspective, humans yeah. must be this giant thing. Yeah, you know, snakes are only two inches tall. <laughs> <laughs> you know yeah no matter how long they are yeah, yeah, yeah. well and and uh pardon me and snakes don't hate people that's that's so hard to get across snakes don't hate people they want nothing to do with us and so almost every human on this planet carries a digital camera in his pocket so take two steps back the biggest snake ever lived in mississippi can't harm you two paces back takes three steps if you're more comfortable <laughs> take a picture send it to me send it to libby send it into the to the to the show here and and if it's the least bit of a of a, a good picture we can tell you exactly what it is and you know but don't kill the snake most snake bites the the vast majority of snake bites in america take place during a conscious deliberate interaction with the snake trying to kill the snake trying to pick it up trying to have their picture taken and alcohol figures into about 50% of all snake bites in America. What more do I need to say? Yeah, that's, that's not surprising yeah. when you think about it. Yeah. And young male adults. <laughs> young yeah. male adults. Yeah. Well, you know, that thing, I was uh, had some trees removed in my backyard several months ago, and the guy said uh, that he had seen a snake, but it was one of those where it's like, there he is. And I looked, and it's like, that snake was yeah. gone. And, you know, so it's it's sometimes hard to even see the snake because they're, they're well, good they, at uh, getting away from They rely on, on protective coloration and running away and bluffing and finally biting if you don't give them a chance. All right, that's going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by contributions from listeners. To hear today's show or a previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Java Chapman, and our engineer today was Abram Nanny. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Terry Vendevender, I'm Kevin Farrell, inviting you to stay tuned. Up next, it's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone.